whatever the length of that job well, is. Yeah, that's correct. So, so that would be the closest days. comparison I could come up with for today. Uh, now these men would wait there from early morning until as late as 5 in the evening. They were desperate. They were desperately hoping that somebody would need them for the day and would come and ask them to go to work. Now you need to understand that these men were common laborers, which was the lowest class of workers. Life for them and their families was a pretty precarious day-to-day hand-to-mouth situation. Seven fifty an hour. Uh, what was that? Seven fifty an hour. Yeah. <laughs> oh, minimum wage. Oh, minimum wage. Yeah. Uh, it'd be like down here on the dam. Those guys working in that kind of condition for five bucks a day. Anyway, slaves were regarded. Uh, at least uh, to some extent, as members of a family unit. And in normal times, slaves were never in, in danger of starvation. They, they were always guaranteed the same kind of food that the other household members were getting. But the common laborers was a different story. If they didn't get that one denarius that one day, it was catastrophic. They had no other options. The work hours given in the parable are actually normal Jewish hours. The day began at 6 in the morning, and the hours were counted from then on until it was 6 in the evening. So therefore, the third hour would have been 9 in the morning, the sixth hour would have been noon, the eleventh hour is 5 p.m. Okay. So this uh, parable is really a, a very real, uh, true picture of what could easily happen in the marketplace of any Jewish village when the grape har harvest was being rushed to, to be completed, to beat the rain. Okay, we've heard the parable read, and now we understand the details of the parable. So what? What has it got to do with what heaven is like? <laughs> well, believe it or not, there are five very important truths in this parable that are well worth talking about. First of all, this is this is probably some of the part that my wife snuck in and read. It surely was. <laughs> In a sense, the parable is a warning, a warning to the disciples, a warning to all of us today. It's as if Jesus said, you know, you have received the great privilege of being a part of the church, of being in the church's fellowship, of sharing in the grace of God. And some of you uh, have been doing this for many, many years, decades most of your life. But you cannot claim any special privilege or honor or recognition simply because you were a Christian before others were. You know, if you became a, a, a converted Christian and accepted Christ at the age of 12 or 15 and someone else you know didn't do it till they were 65, that, that doesn't give you any, spe any special privileges. Everybody who comes to God, regardless of when, are equal, equally precious in the sight of God. You know, it's a sad commentary, but there's a lot of folks, I've known a couple of them, who think that since they've been good church members and givers to the church for many, many years or decades, they think the church belongs to them personally. And you can even hear them making a mistake, a very small mistake. You don't go to God's church, you go to my church. That's my church. I was there. I built that sucker. It's mine. It's no longer even God's church. And these people very often resent the intrusion of new blood, new people coming in. Uh, you know, they, they don't like new people to come up with new ideas and, and, uh, and uh, different ways of doing things. We've never done it that way before. I don't want to hear about it. <laughs> what it boils down to is, in Christianity, seniority does not mean special privilege. There's a second truth. Now, hold on, though. He was speaking to the Jews at the time. There were no Christians. That's correct. That's so, correct. But I'm saying... 
not only was he speaking to the Jews, but this speaks to us oh, okay. I, I as, as an interpretation. Oh, okay. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Yeah. The parable also I serves as a warning to the Jews in general. Yes. Because the Jews, I mean, the Jews knew they were the chosen people. I mean, they always believed in that. They never forgot it. But as a result, they looked down their noses at just about everybody else. Right. Uh, mostly at Gentiles, <laughs> but also at tax collectors, prostitutes, sinners of all various and sundry kinds. Any of the other tribes. And in the other tribes. Mm -hmm. And often hating and despising these people to the point of praying for their destruction. We talked about this a week or two ago. We were talking about the, the attitude of the Pharisees and, and religious leaders towards towards common people in the street. Same as today. Hmm? Same as today. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Not, a lot of things don't change. <laughs> this very same attitude that the Jews had about other people manifests itself in the early church. Say that again. That attitude becomes okay. part of the early church oh, okay. because the original <coughs> Jewish Christians allowed Gentiles into their fellowship but only as inferiors. If you uh, were a Gentile and wanted to join the, the Christian faith initially you had to become a Jew first, which meant you had to be circumcised first. Right. Mm. That's enough to discourage a person. <laughs> uh, so, um, this uh, this whole attitude uh, doesn't play out for, for the Christians because in truth those of us who have been Christians for a long time may very well have a great deal to learn from younger, newer oh, people. Yeah. And uh, that new blood brings refreshing and, and, and energy and, and should be valued, not, not looked down on your nose at. Third, the parable also presents to us what you would probably call, quote, the comfort of God. See, no matter when a person enters the kingdom, it doesn't make any difference whether it's late in life, whether it's in the passion of youth, the strength of mid-age, or even the shadows of infirmity and old age. <laughs> that person is equally precious to God. There's no distinguishing between those who come at any time in life. You know, sometimes a, a person dies full of years, 85, 90 years old, lots of honors, um, accomplishments and achievements, career successfully completed and, and well done but then sometimes a younger person dies almost before the door of life has even opened from God they both receive the same pay the same welcome does it make any difference whether they only serve for one hour or for all twelve hours Jesus awaits for both. So in a divine sense, no life ends too soon or too late. All are accepted and extended the full grace of God. Fourth, we can also see in this uh, little parable the infinite compassion of God. You know, one, one of the really tragic stories, I think, of, uh, of life are persons whose talent whose abilities are wasting away because they don't have anything to do. They, they've never been given the opportunity. They don't, they don't have uh, a, a place or a way of exercising their talent and abilities. These kind of people stand like the men in the parable in the marketplace, waiting and waiting and waiting because nobody would hire them. Nobody would give them an opportunity. Nobody would give them a chance. But in his compassion, the master gives them work to do. All of them. The master doesn't want to see any of them idle or wasting their time and just standing around doing nothing. In strict fairness, 
let's be honest. The fewer hours a man works, the less pain he should receive. It's only fair, right? If I put in a 10-hour day working in the heat, and some Johnny come lately came along and put in an hour in the cool of the evening and got the same pay as me, I'd be upset. I wouldn't like it either. You know, I'm no, I'm no human being. But the master knows that if a man were to return home with less than the full denarius pay, he wouldn't be able to feed his family. So the master goes beyond what is fair, he goes beyond what is due, because he's compassionate enough not to want anyone to starve. And then fifth, we also see uh, in all of this the generosity of God. Like we said, these men didn't do all the same work, but they did receive the same pay. Um, God's grace is abundant, lavished upon all who accept it. Two things we can learn from this. With God, all service ranks the same. It is not the amount of service that is important, but it is the love in which that service is given. A man out of his plenty may give a gift of a hundred pounds. And in truth, we're grateful for that. A child may give us a birthday or Christmas gift which cost only a few pennies, but which was laboriously and lovingly saved up for. And that gift, with little value of its own, touches our heart far more than the hundred pounds. Uh, God, God does not look for the amount of service. So long as it is all we have to give, all service ranks the same with God. And there is a second lesson. All that God gives us is grace upon grace. We can't earn it. We don't deserve it. It's given out of the Master's goodness. It isn't it is not pay that he gives for services rendered. It's a gift that the master gives out of his own kindness. It's not a reward. It's grace. <coughs> well, the supreme lesson of this parable, the whole point of working in the parable or serving in the church boils down to the spirit in which it is given. <coughs> The first group of workers had an agreement, they had a contract with the master. They were to work so much for so much pay. Their concern was to get as much out of their work as possible, of course. The other group of workers had a, no contract, no agreement. All they wanted was a chance to work. Even even if they were willing to accept whatever the master was willing to give them. Remember the parable, the master hires these people later and he says, I'll pay you what's fair. He doesn't even say how much. They're just glad to get their hours in and, and get something. Well, a person is not really a Christian if all they are concerned about is the amount of pay they will get. their service. A Christian should work for the joy of serving God and fellow man, not for how big the reward will be in the end. That is why the first will be last and the last will be first. Many a man in this world who has earned great rewards will have a very low place in the kingdom because those rewards were his sole thought. Many a man who, as the world counts it, is a poor man, will be great in the kingdom. Because he never thought in terms of reward, but he worked for the thrill of working and for the joy of serving. 
It is the paradox of the Christian life that he who aims at reward loses it, and he who forgets reward finds it. And so we have the parable of the... Now, you, you had mentioned that vineyard. that parable was talking about heaven, heaven right? The kingdom of heaven. <clears throat> Here's the way I look at that parable. Two things. Number one is you can be saved on your deathbed where you can be saved much earlier in your life. Guess where you're going? You're both going to heaven. The master and the workers are going to the same place. And the other thing is, if you think about a Super Bowl, you know, okay, you can be sitting in Texas Stadium in an air-conditioned suite at the 50-yard line, and you can own the team. And you're there to see that. I know them. his name. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And, and you can have, you can be almost penniless and not own a television and go to Best Buy and you both can see the same game. The game is going to be exactly the same from beginning to end and the score will be exactly the same to both. So the penniless person in Best Buy sees the game no more, no less than the guy sitting in the air-conditioned box. And that's what heaven is. It's the same place. It's the same destination. And it's going to be the same. So the master who hired the workers and the workers are going to the same place if the master is saved in his lifetime. So that helps me out because then I know, because I don't have a lot of money, but I got a TV. I don't need a box. <laughs> you got a very nice TV. See side the side. same game. And you can get the best play. Yeah, I could. You too. Yeah, <laughs> that's so, right. And I think the other thing about this too is about not coveting what your neighbor or anybody has. You know, you don't, you, as a Christian, you're not supposed to spend your time saying, that's not fair, he got $3, I only got $2. So you are coveting, which is, of course, well, the one part of the, the Ten Commandments. The part of the parable that, that I really like is is where the end of the day comes, they're going to meet out the pay. Right. And the, the guys who were there the shortest period of time get paid first. So that by the time the guys who work the longest period of time get up, they're expecting a lot more. They don't get it. They get the same thing that they agreed to from the beginning. Yeah, but they're they're. And then they get upset. They get angry at the master. But they're too tired to make to do anything about it. <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> they're upset because they they think they deserve more because they work the longest. Oh yeah, I understand well, that. The, the they worked about, the longest, or they were there the longest. It doesn't mean they. Uh, yeah, that's true worked. too. They may not even have worked that hard. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's, those. Could be a unit guy. But the master says, hey, you know, it's my money. Can I do what I want with my own money? But why is he showing off with it? He's the Pharisee that is praising public and gives the <laughs> yeah, charity. Right. Uh, so he's a bit of a jerk and he was looking for <laughs> Well, I don't know about that. Uh, what, what I, I, don't, I don't know about that. But what I, I was trying to say was, God says, you know, it's my grace. And I can offer it as freely as I want and abundantly as I want to anybody. No matter who, what you think about it, yeah. no yeah. matter what you agree to, it's I, same. I, can, I can give my grace to, in full amount to the person yeah. who accepted me at the last moment. And the, of the destination life. of that grace is heaven. Right. And faith is what brings you there. Right. Right. Because they all went to work with faith that they were going to get paid right, something, something for their efforts. Right, right. They didn't know how much. Right. And in the end, I'm sure, uh, in the parable, they are very pleasantly delighted that they, they got what they got. So okay. For, uh, jewels in the crown. Yeah, no, no, the don't start on that. <laughs> oh, gosh, I, I hate that. One more star in my crown. Uh, I hated doing that job, but I got another star out of it anyway. <laughs> The other parable for today comes from Matthew 21. It's the parable of the two bad sons. This is a parable that uh, some aren't familiar with. There was a man who had two sons. He went to the first and he said, Son, go and work today in the vineyard for me. The son said, I will not. <laughs> But later, he changed his mind and went. 
Then the father went to the other son and he said the same thing. The other son answered, Yes, sir, I will. But he never went. <laughs> Therefore, which of the two did what his father wanted? Well, the disciples were listening and they said, Well, the first. Jesus said to them, I'll tell you the truth. Tax collectors and the prostitutes are entering the kingdom of God ahead of you. If you were a Pharisee, this would upset you greatly. <laughs> For John came to show you the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him, but the tax collectors and the prostitutes did. And even after you saw this, you did not repent and believe him. So. Well, that's kind of funny. We go off of the two sons, and now we're into the prostitutes. Yeah, let's get this. <laughs> fine. Let's get this straight right from the get-go. Right. <laughs> let's make sure we got the bottom line right at the beginning here, from the start. Clearly, the Jewish religious leaders are the people who said that they would obey God, and that they did not do so. Tax collectors and harlots and others were those who said they would go their own way, but then in the end, they end up following the way of God. So, to correctly understand this parable, it's important to realize it's not giving praise to anybody. What we see here are two imperfect groups of people. <laughs> Nobody in this parable is perfect. Neither son was the kind of son that brought great joy to the father, I would guess. Both were unsatisfactory, but the one who in the end obeyed was at least better than the other one. The ideal son would have been one who accepted the father's orders obediently and with respect, and then unquestionably carried them out fully to the best of his ability. That would be the son you would be proud of. He's the one that doesn't get the party, so hey. <laughs> That's the other parable. Yeah. <laughs> so it tells us that there's, we're talking about two different classes of people in this world. There are people whose profession is much better than their practice. Okay? They promise anything, they make great protestations of piety and fidelity, but in practice, their behavior lags far behind. And then there are those whose practice is far better than their profession. I mean, a lot of these people claim to be tough, hard-headed, materialists, but, but somehow or other, they are discovered doing very kind and generous things. And sometimes quietly and even in secret where nobody knows about it. They are people who often profess openly that they have no interest in the church. I don't, I'm not going to church. No interest in religion at all, but when it comes to the truth, they live, I hate to say this, a more Christian life than many who profess to be Christians. I mean, we've all seen, I think, these types of folks. But the real point of the parable is that while the second class of people are infinitely preferred to the first class, neither group is perfect truly good person would be the one whose profession and practice match. It's not about words, it's about deeds. Yes. If you profess something, it's not worth much unless you live it. Furthermore, the parable teaches us that promises can never take the place of performance. Fine words, flowery pronouncements, just ain't no substitute for good deeds. Might sound good, <laughs> but that's all. The son who said he would go out and did not had all the outward signs of courtesy. Did you notice that? The answer he gave his father was, yes, sir. He was very respectful. <laughs> but a courtesy that never goes beyond words isn't anything more than an illusion. <coughs> True courtesy involves obedience, willingly, and graciously given. The parable also teaches us that a person can easily spoil a good thing by the way that they do it. 
you can do a good deed. You can do a good thing for somebody. But with so much a lack of graciousness and joy, the whole end of things gets spoiled by the, the whole deed gets spoiled by the attitude. So, the bottom line of this parable is, is that the Christian